now. Great. Well, welcome everybody. Here we have another episode of The Three Amigos. Ron, Ed, and I are uh, excited about being able to present you something that we think is important. You know, sometimes it's difficult. You can't get to where you want to go if you don't know where you are. And so today, Ed's going to be talking about an assessment tool we found that can help define kind of where you are. So as you move forward, either to sell the business or for whatever reason, you get a better idea as to what you need to fix. So you're not working on things that aren't going to be meaningful. So with that, I'm going to, I'm going to pass this on to Ed. And Ed, would you kindly walk us through the seven steps? Yes. Uh, thank you, Ray. And uh, thanks, Ron, for uh, yes. this opportunity to talk about further talk about the seven steps uh, for optimizing and transitioning your business. And um, as you can see the slide, it, there's a lot involved. There's seven steps and each step has quite a bit of work involved with it. And um, it's hard for people that want to sell their business or want to improve their business to figure out where to get started. That's why I think this session, we're going to be talking about step one. And to me, it's probably the most important step because without doing step one, you're never going to get involved in the process. So uh, before we get into step one, though, I'd like to just summarize real quickly the seven steps. The first step that we'll be talking more about today is valuation and assessments. The second step, which uh, uh, we talked about many times before, is developing a strategic plan that can be used to grow and reduce risk. And um, the third step is to reduce risk. And, and in that step, we, we look at risk management. We look at opportunities maybe to take some chips off the table by reducing equity. And we talk about succession planning. And it's something that is very important that is very seldom addressed in any company but adds a significant amount of value to the succession plan. And we all know that getting the owner out of the day-to-day -day, uh, aspects of the business really increases the value of the business. Step four are the value strategies, and that's where we address our value wheel of eight value drivers. And um, the fifth step is culture. And Culture is, uh, I'm becoming to realize how, how important it really is, much more important than I gave it uh, credit for at the beginning of our conversations. Uh, but culture does eat strategy for breakfast. That's the old term, it's really true. If you don't have this relentless execution on increasing value, you'll never increase value, no matter how great your strategies are. So that step's extremely important. Step six is when you look at a balance sheet, the biggest assets aren't on the balance sheet. They're the intangible assets. They're your market, your, your customers, your processes, automation that you use to get things done effectively. And don't forget people, people are everything. Growth and margins that all translates into assets that are not on a gap prepared financial statement. That's increased value. And that's something you wanna grow even further. And then the last step, when you get to the top of the, of the stairwell, uh, you're looking at exit strategies. But none of this makes any sense unless you can get started. And today we're gonna to talk a little bit about step one of finding out is the business optimized, you're, you're collecting information about the business, you're analyzing what services it provides, what goods that it sells, um, and, and its position in the marketplace. And it starts with learning the business and um, a review of the financial statements. That, the financial statements are the official scorecard, but a lot of times you can't even find them they're hidden. Nobody wants to know what they are because I guess uh, the owners at times, they, wanna, they want this to be a secret. Well, it's the biggest, one of the biggest tools you have in running a company is to analyze financial statements and see if you're improving. Um, a second area is market analysis, uh, products and services that you provide in your position in the marketplace. 
Uh, that has uh, Ron Burgess uh, knows so much more about that than than I do, but it's really important. I mean, I can scratch the surface. If you want the deep dive, you got to talk to Ron and he'll put you on a process over time that is really going to demonstrate a lot of value. Um, and it might be important to note that, you know, we have some great uh, summaries of this that Ron did actually for us on earlier versions. Absolutely. Of, uh, Eagles. So, yeah, yeah. yeah you're, ta you're talking about on, on our channel, uh, yes. our YouTube channel. Right, right. That's the micro, micro giant YouTube channel. And you get there by just typing in micro giant uh, mentoring and that that those keywords will get you, uh, you know, put us right on the top. So cool. Thank you. Um, the, the thing that we're going to be talking about in depth today is a business assessment. And it's uh, over 100 questions that you sit down with the management team and you document the answers. And uh, it'll identify uh, aspects for your SWOT analysis, which will come in step two, kind of lays the, the foundation for that. And it looks for opportunities of reducing risk, adding value, and increasing your um, the value of your company. What makes your company special? And uh, so we're going to talk about that next. Just to, to finish off this schedule, the other thing we want to do is prepare evaluation of the, bus of the business. And the, the valuation has to be done in a numbers-oriented basis in which uh, you, you understand what drivers are of the valuation so that you can improve upon them in future meetings. So uh, I love the five-year discounted cash flow method. Uh, it forces you to do a uh, forecast. And once you do that forecast, you can evaluate how well you're doing to that forecast. And it educates everybody on the team, um, the ownership, and as well as management as to what's important and what's not important for growing the value of the business. And then I know um, Ray and Ron have more experience on behavioral profile assessments, the teamwork that's necessary to pull all this off. Um, but I, I kind of put all this as the first step, learning the business. Is there anything you guys want to say before we, we jump into the uh, assessment? Yeah, I was going to add, uh, and then I'll let Ron uh, add his piece, but, uh, you know, behavioral profiles are really helpful. Ron uses a little different tool than I do, but the, uh, the, the, the most important thing is that as we're looking at the company, it's also important to know the personalities and who they are and, and having a common language that everybody understands. So Ron uses one tool, I use another one, but basically, they all provide these people with a common understanding of who they are and how they're different and how they can work together to kind of stay in their strengths and have other people help them when they have areas of weakness. <coughs> yeah, I would agree with that. I'll, uh, I'll just kind of comment on, uh, on uh, some, some of the marketing stuff. Um, one of the things that, uh, and of course, this depends on orientation. Uh, and Ed's a CPA. Uh, he's been a um, controller of large large companies, and he uses the official scorecard, your financial statements, uh, as exactly that. And that's that's exactly right. That's what they are there for. Um, depending on the size of the business, though, I mean, uh, you also have to remember that if you don't have any business, it doesn't matter if you measure it. And so um, that's why it's so important to really understand how to get the cash register to, to ring. And years ago when I, uh, I mean, some 34, five, six, seven years ago when I started doing consulting after I sold my businesses, uh, um, our instructor was six weeks of instruction for this, this national company I was with. And our instructor simply said, um, you know, nothing happens until a cash register rings. And so uh, this company was about buying inventory, primarily uh, retail uh, fashion stores. And his point was really pretty well taken. And that is every single time somebody would bring up something outside of what we would call merchandising planning, which is a heavy numbers oriented process. It's not 
It's not how you do displays. Um, but they would they'd say, well, what about this? And what about that? Or what is these expenses? And, that, and he would always say, look, nothing happens until the cash register rings. And eventually all of us in class, there are about 20 of us, uh, got, got the point. Stop uh, asking questions about things that don't drive revenue. We drive revenue. So um, pretty important. That's my, my orientation. And so uh, it's, it's awfully key when you take a look at pro products and services and your position in the market to understand the strategies, the, um, I guess, the known truths. There are some, believe it or not, about where you are in the marketplace, uh, how you're perceived in the marketplace in a, in a variety, about seven or eight of, you know, issues there that um, literally, if you're in the wrong place, you won't ever make any money because it's, uh, the competition is going to be too tough. The market doesn't exist. The products you have are going to be obsolete in a variety of things. So the market analysis is a is a um, uh, a brief market analysis is really key and very important. And if you don't score in well enough in the market analysis, uh, you probably better just plan on uh, phasing your business out. Because if there's no future for your business, it'll come out in the market analysis. Well, I, I think if you could only have one of the five, I think you better have the market analysis. Uh, I, I would agree. <clears throat> I would agree. Because if there is no revenue, you have nothing. There, Yeah, if there is no market, it's like, well, okay, who cares if we do a financial pro forma? It doesn't, doesn't matter. And the interesting thing is, is that if you look at most business plans, SBA and several others, many, many people do, do how to write a business plan, what's the first thing they do? They say, oh, what's your mission statement? Okay, fine, you got a mission statement. Your mission statement ought to be, we wanna find a market that is big enough to make money in. That should be the mission statement. Uh, if, you, if you have some sort of purpose that you wanna you know, engage in, I mean, that's all fine, those are good things, but you know, be realistic about whether or not you can enter a market and be competitive. Most new businesses and entrepreneurs, and we're not necessarily talking about new businesses here at all, we're mostly talking about businesses that have been around a while, but uh, there are a lot of business people, and then I'll stop talking, but there are a lot of business people who spent their lives uh, building a nice business, and they're partially frustrated because they've only grown one or two percent, or maybe even you know, lost one or two percent for the last four or five years. They're tired of beating their head against the the wall and, and you know moving forward, but they can't. And a lot of times it's because their market's over. You need to know that before you decide to, to try and sell your business. So there, there's all these companies out there we hear about that are interested in exit strategies and maybe transitioning out of their business over the next three to five years. But when you try to find these folks, they're pretty hard to find. And I, I think it has a lot to do with, you know, seven steps with a lot of different steps involved in each one. It's a pretty complicated and um, comprehensive process. And the key is to somehow get started. And recently, Ray Anderson and I had an opportunity to analyze a few business assessments. There, there's several of them out there. We, in particular, we, we like the one that was prepared by Larry O'Toole. Um, do you remember the name of his company, Ray? Yosemite Associates, was it? You're on mute, Ray. Yes, Yosemite Associates. So that, uh, that, that's kind of the starting point for all this. So thank you. Yeah, and, and you can pick, there's several of them out there in the marketplace, but it's really important to see how powerful these assessments are. Ray and I just had the benefit of going through one with a client this week. And it just changed the whole dynamics of the, uh, of the conversation. Before we started with the assessment, 
the ownership pretty much had a strong feeling of where he was at. He thought he had everything buttoned down and um, really didn't need any additional help and no matter which strategy he selected to go. But I think after we had the opportunity of doing the assessment with his key um, lieutenants in the rooms where you can see there's differences of opinion on how some of these questions are answered, it, it shows how involved this process is, is and how you have to prepare for it accordingly. And uh, the assessment that we're talking about kind of evaluates 10 different business functions. It's, there's over 100 questions. So uh, the questions keep asking uh, things from a different perspective and trying to look for similarity in the answers and making sure people understand the, the full involvement of what it takes to sell a business. And it, the first one of, of, of the 10 is company culture and values. Um, does your team have the ability to execute strategy? That, that, that means so much. I mean, if you, you can have the greatest strategic plan, but if you can't execute it, you got nothing. And it's not that easy to build value and execute strategies. And um, so I really have to agree. I, I, I've always uh, cited on the strategy side, but I really believe Culture probably is more important because without culture, you ain't going anywhere. Um, so that's kind of the, that's number one of the 10 uh, business functions. The second one is team alignment and accountability or, or is the team on the same plan? Um, do they measure their accomplishments? Is there accountability um, for their actions? Um, and then how do the, how do people on the, on the team and in the company behave without the owner present? Uh, that's usually, uh, an interesting observation that completely different people can be act completely differently when the owner is involved as if the owner's not involved. So very important, common beliefs, priorities, and focus, team alignment, very important. Number three, and, and this is where I normally used to start off everything, and, I, and I'm beginning to question whether that was a smart move or not, but very important, but it's, you got to learn a lot about the company before you get into strategic planning process. And uh, you really need one, and, and uh, the companies we've talked to, none of them have one. If they have one, it's sitting on the shelf and, shelf and nobody's looked at it for the last three to five years. Um, you got to know where your company is going and what important strategies you have and what are your strategic and competitive advantages and are you maximizing those to build the company to increase valuation by building value and reducing risk. And so the strategic planning process is important and like we said, very few companies have made that investment. Four is a high-performing business organization. There's no secrets. People know what's going on. They're looking at the numbers every month. They know which way they're headed. They know if, they're, if people are being accountable for what they're supposed to be doing. Do, do you have the right people in place? Are they in the right roles? Do they have the right focus? Uh, aligned with company values. And, and the other thing it just came up in another client today was succession planning. Succession planning is very important because number one, it takes the owner out of the day-to-day -day operations of the company. And we all know every company is worth a lot more money if the owner is not involved in the day-to-day. -day. But just as importantly, the key positions have to have the right expertise of people leading those functions and there has to be backup because if you buy a company and you find out that their top leadership leaves you could be left with nothing yeah they make the Let company me, run can i ask you to just a little bit you've mentioned twice 
Uh, everybody knows that the company is worth more when the owner's not involved day to day. Uh, you know, I, I feel a few company owners cringing when, when, when you say that. Uh, why don't you briefly explain why that's true? Okay, very good. Uh, if, the, if the business owner stays with the company and it's sold, um, the value is there. If, if you buy a company and, and the owner is leaving, then you got a big void in your company that you have to make up some other way. And as we talked about, every position, including the ownership position, needs backup in case something that happens unexpectedly, the company can continue to run. Please feel to jump in on that, uh, Ron, and, and provide maybe some more substance. Sure. Well, I, I'm really sort of parroting, you know, Ray, something I, I learned from Ray years ago, and, and that is that uh, part of the problem is the owner. Now, we don't, we don't mean that, uh, that the owner is not really a genius of some sort because obviously if a business has been successful been in business for five or six years or maybe 10 or 20 or 30 you're already in a very small percentile to start businesses so that's that's all you know understood there's a lot of success a uh, big pat on the back etc however many times especially if your sales have lagged for three or four or five years and you're getting you no know, less than a two or three percent increase or five percent even um, there's something about that that is wrong, and many times what can be wrong is one of the things that can go wrong is that the owner, uh, the business has outgrown the owner. Uh, mm -hmm. Not a thing to say about the uh, lack of success of the owner. There are very few entrepreneurs who can go through a transition period um, from, and I'll just throw out numbers, from 80 employees to 120 employees. Uh, from um, uh, depending on the industry, 10 million to 20 million for uh, some, some other industries that can be as low as 2 million to 4 million, um, or maybe from 10 to 20 employees. There, so at some point in this process, the owner now who has been so brilliant when it was new uh, is, is not the manager that he or she thinks they were. Uh, and therefore, um, getting out of the business can actually help it grow. Now, so what, what I think, we, and, and another piece of what we're saying to add on to Ed's is that when someone takes a look at a business where the owner is not active day to day, they know the management team is solid and everything's not dependent upon the owner. Right. And as important as we as owners think we are, and I've been there, done this seven times, and I'm always the most important guy in the room. Um, it, it doesn't help any if you want to sell the business. Yeah. Because if I'm the most important guy in the room and I'm not there, now nobody's important anymore. So you got to have people that can run the business without the owner there. That's ownership. That's real ownership. Yes. And, and, and I think uh, to... to... To piggyback on that, Ron, you know, it really makes a huge amount of difference for an investor when he knows that the owner of the company has been sophisticated enough to manage his way out of the business and still keep it profitable. You know, so that he can, you know, the whole point about being financially independent is that you get to do what you want when you want. But if you have to be in the business eight or 10 or 12 hours a day, that's not financial independence, that's slavery. Right. Yeah, right. And, and, and the, the, the goal for every owner, especially if they want to sell their business, the goal ought to be, I'm going to get down to two days a week. Yep. And then I'm yep. going to get to one day a week. And then yep. I'm going to get to three or four or five days a month. And that should be it. Because, um, you know, if you sell it to somebody who's going to come in and take over a great strategy that you put together, you're going to pay top dollar when it works without you. Yep. Yep. So there's, I don't know what the multiple is, Ed, but just having a company without an owner there must increase the, the multiple that, that somebody would pay for enormously. Yes, I would agree. Well, I think it comes down to a word called scale. If you can scale your company, then you have a big potential down the road of value. 
And that means you got to have more than one person involved. That one person, the owner, can be, become a bottleneck to scalability right. of the business. You bet. And why do they do that? Well, I think they want to save money, right? Because um, bring in other talent into the business, it's going to cost them some money. Yeah. And you're making an investment on the future. So you're with that future investment, you're hoping that you can increase earnings by five times what you're currently doing. Right. right. Yeah. So, wow. That's progressive so to thinking. Piggy, to piggyback on your comment there, uh, there are a lot of owners that do real well, $100,000 to $300,000 or more that they're pulling out of their business, but they do it because they are doing all the work and they're mm -hmm. paying their people 50,000 and they ought to be 80,000. Right, they, exactly. They, they've taken the money themselves instead of training their people to run it for them. Yeah. And so exactly. you actually have to get big enough <coughs> and sophisticated enough to have two or three top people in key positions that are paid at least market value, if not higher, so that when the company comes in to buy you, they go, wow, you've got good people, you're paying market value. I'm not going to have to get raises to get people to stay. Right. Um, right. All we have to do is sit in the board meetings and make sure the strategy stays solid. Yep. That's a great company to buy right there. And and to to piggyback on what you said earlier, Ron, you know, the, the important part about this is making sure that you analyze the market all the time and look for new things and look for innovation and look for make sure that the market hasn't moved away from you. You know, mm -hmm. the guy who knows this most effectively is Ed Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> sort of an in, inside joke, huh? Yeah, right. But, it but wasn't Ed's right. fault, I mean, but the, it, the, the market changed right beneath his feet. Yeah, exactly. So, you exactly. know, there, there are times when things change, and there is not a thing that any individual person can do about it. Um, you know, I mean, if you're in the landline business, you're out of business. Yes. Yeah, no. Everybody wants a cell phone. And so it's like it's oh, of course. Or if you're in the buggy whip business, you were out of business a long time ago when, when you no longer needed a horse to pull your buggy. So that's what happened to Ed. Um and uh he was on the wrong the wrong buggy, the at the wrong horse, but it you know wasn't his fault. But it goes back to the point you made, and I think what Ed has on uh, we're trying to convey with this is that you know, the market analysis has to be done every year. You know, it's not like something you do and then you say, well, I've got it and keep going. Because to your point, if you know, if you want the cash register to ring, you better make sure the market's still there. Well, you're you're right. And actually, I, I see it as a more frequent thing. Uh, every business that I've ever been in, I think about the market on a daily basis. Uh, that, you know, concerns me. I could get people to do just about anything else. Uh, and hire the right people, uh, particularly when I was in in the retail business, uh, I was deeply in the market, traveled all across the country in order to make sure I did understand the market four to five times a year. Yeah. That's what you call being in the market. You yeah. have to care and you have to watch all the time to make sure your market is still strong. And in fact, I was in the same situation as Ed. The business climate changed. My specialty was uh, narrow. The competitors came in when it changed, they ate my lunch. Mm. When they couldn't do it in my niche, but when that yep. niche went away, the big guys came in and they just copied me and I didn't look any different than anybody else. Wow. And that was a tough time. Yep. That was a slow growth time, three or four years uh, of, of two and three business in, uh, percentage increase at, with inflation at 10, 15 percent, I was going backwards. It yeah. was not fun anymore. It wasn't fun. Yeah. No, and this, and this is good stuff from us because uh, I think all of us are talking from experience. You know, it's not like we learned this theoretically. <laughs> so yeah. anyway, uh, go ahead. Ed. You can tell by the bruises on her forehead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's for sure. But I, I, I think one of the, you know, people are everything and be being able to hire high potential performers yeah. and paying and sometimes paying over market to get the right person that really is going to make a difference in your company. It's, it's contrary to the way a lot of people believe and think because they're, they're trying to squeeze that nickel as, as hard as they possibly can, but they're missing hundreds of dollars of 
other opportunities because they can't get beyond that. So somewhere down the road, we ought to really talk about, and I think we've talked about this before, about hiring talent yeah. in the corporation and making that investment is extremely important. So if you're on this journey and you're looking at the seven-step process, probably hiring one or two capable people that could take your company to the next level is extremely important. And I've seen it in just about every company I've helped uh, uh, help bridge that gap. Uh, it came down to hiring some, some more people to add that capacity and make things run better. Yeah. The fifth business function is when we talked about how important it was when we, we started this conversation and that is the customer always comes first. Without a customer, you have none, nothing. It's why the company exists. Unfortunately, a lot of financial folks included don't think about that. They think they assume that that's going to continue, but it doesn't always continue. And you have to really be able to spend some time in that area analyzing how are you meeting your customer expectations? Do you have contracts with your customers so that you know that they can't back out the last minute? Do you have reoccurring revenue with them? How sticky are they to your organization? Do they really need you or are they looking for an opportunity to go somewhere else? Are, are you talking to your customers? Believe it or not, that is one basic element of communication that many times doesn't happen in every company. They're not talking to their customers. And then all of a sudden, the, the, the marketing guy will come in and say, we just lost our number one customer. Right. What a surprise. That shouldn't have been a surprise. It should have been right. all over. And so, and I'll just point, point out a little, a, a little uh, caveat here. Uh, and that is, you've got it right. Customers always come first. They're not on the financial statement. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so you know, you can kind of look at customers by saying, well, here's revenue. You can also say, Here's revenue by category of product. You can also take a look at that geographically, probably not on a financial statement. And you might even take a look at that on an individual basis uh, if you have a, a, a really good uh, accounting system. Um, but typically it is not on the financial statement. And therefore, you know, I would, I would just kind of throw it out and submit that um, the, uh, the scorecard is not complete. It needs the customer and marketing scorecard in order to be able to have a, a real understanding of the future of your business. Absolutely. And if you remember, step six was intangible assets. And customers fall into that intangible asset phase. It's not a historical cost associated with it, but it sure has a future value to that company. And so that's that's part of uh, trying to analyze what your intangible value of the company is. And have you, obviously, analyzing the customers is really important. If you looked at them over the last five years and you see it's the same customers and, and, and their revenue is growing, uh, I would say you're in pretty good uh, state. Um, however, if, you're, if your uh, customers keep changing radically uh, year after year, uh, you may have a problem brewing. Sixth is uh, once you have a customer, you got to take care of their needs eff effectively, efficient in, a, in an efficient manner with high quality and productivity. And, the, and it's got to be scalable because uh, as you handle more customers, you need the wherewithal to, to take care of their needs. And this is where technology becomes extremely important is automating uh, some of these support processes so that you know they're always being handled properly. And if there's a problem, someone's being notified right away, rather uh, at a time when it's too late, uh, when the problem is way out of control, and then you're trying to salvage the opportunity um, and make it go away over time. That's not the way to run a company. And uh, having a consistent for full fulfillment model of best practices and people that want to do things better each and every day really makes a difference. Because if you're not meeting this expectation and you're not cutting costs out, eventually you'll be overpriced in the market. 
Um, the seventh um, uh, area of business that's important is uh, stellar financial performance and a strong balance sheet. And I think a lot of times people focus on the P&Ls, but they don't have a clue of what's the, the assets in the balance sheet that are necessary to run that business, especially uh, the investment and uh, working capital. And uh, so those are all important. I think sometimes people spend more time on seven than they do on five. And I think maybe they should be doing just the opposite. I agree. Uh, the eighth one is well-defined operating systems. And uh, this is all changed over time because in the old days we had to do everything manually. And, and now uh, you can write policies and procedures so that everybody knows how to run the company uh, without you being there. You can automate a lot of these. That makes it even more bulletproof and more consistent and uh, more productive. And um, you can integrate systems and processes like you couldn't before. Now, nowadays, you can have one accounting system that handles the production and the accounting side. It's possible. In the old days, it wasn't possible. And um, the, the fewer systems that you have and the more they're integrated, the more efficient the company is. And we, we all talk about investing in uh, training and automation and, you know, raise an expert on the training part. It's really important um, that you're making those investments. And um, following best practices makes a big difference also. Let me, let me uh, throw in there that I, I know that you mean digital as well as automation. Uh, um, but I just want to use the word digital as, uh, too so that it's clarified. Um, when, when you say consistency of operations and integrate systems and processes, you know, today much of that means digital. And as you mentioned, when you have all your systems working together, that creates efficiency. It certainly does. Um, and I, I want to add that, um, you know, so much of the customer interaction is digital today that uh, in a lot of companies are the smaller ones are especially are not embracing that. Um, you know, here we are using uh, <laughs> using a, a system to communicate with uh, Zillow and uh, everybody's using it. It's been incredible uh, in just the last two years. But really, this this is just a little piece of it. And uh, Zillow has new features. Um, uh, excuse me, not Zillow. Um, Zoom has new features. And uh, they're going to continue to have new features. Other companies will have those kinds of features. Uh, there are also systems designed to take care of customer relationships. And those are more and more uh, working towards some possibilities of integrating that with your financial systems. Um, the expectation of customers that they will have at least some uh, digital and or the appearance of some digital through websites, that's all part of well-defined operating systems. And uh, companies, uh, you know, owners need to be aware of the possibilities. Um, that may be something that's left for the next generation of, of business owners. And uh, if you're trying to sell, that may not be something you are going to, but that will be something that the good buyers are looking to uh, increase in your business. So um, having some employees that uh, are not afraid of using those systems will be very, very key. Spend tons and tons of time on culture. You got to be willing to change some of these things. Yeah, number nine, uh, we're transitioning to number nine now, and that's my all time favorite. Uh, you guys are probably tired about hearing about it from me. But uh, we, yeah, we as business operators get so focused on our day to day routines, we don't look outside the company. We don't know what our competitors are doing. We don't understand our customers. We don't understand uh, market trends, sales multiples. We have no idea of companies out there that we could be partnering with. Um, this all can make a significant difference, but it's very contrary to the way most people view running their business. And in fact, when you mention it to them, they, they almost give you that look like, where did this guy come from? A different planet? Yeah, um, that's certainly 
certainly how most people look at me. <laughs> I can I, I remember that look and they well, why are you bringing this up? Uh, uh, because it can make a big difference. True but if enough. you're not looking, you're going to miss opportunities. If you don't know what companies are being sold um, that you compete with or that your company is complimentary of, you're missing out on opportunities that uh, really can make a big difference to the value of your company. And then we always got to end everything with legal, you know, contracts, um, reducing risk and operating in California, you better have a strong HR department. Um, and um, obviously if, you're, if you have contracts with your customers, you're protected somewhat from people leaving, leaving the company. So legal is important and I don't know how you operate without legal aspects and contracts in the state of California. It's almost impossible. True enough. So Ray and I had this opportunity of going through these 10 questions with a customer and it was a profound reaction. It, it got everybody off the normal, everything is great uh, routine. We're, we're doing fine. We don't need any help in this. Um, and then they find out how complex and how complicated the process is and how many moving parts and how each moving part has an important um, aspect of you selling or transitioning your company or optimizing your company, it helps bring everybody on the, put everybody on the same page. And most importantly, it helps people make that first step into the process. That first step that's so hard to get people to do because I guess they're so overwhelmed by the whole complexity of the whole matter that it's hard to get started. But if you can't take the first step, you're never going to get the process started. You're gonna to wait too long and you're gonna to have to sell your company at uh, a very discounted price or worse yet, your company could end up going out of business because you didn't plan properly for that transition. And yeah, let me, that, add, I'm passing let me remind, along to you two guys to close this thing. Let me remind uh, uh, everyone that again on our same uh, Microgiants channel, uh, under the three the three amigos, uh, consulting amigos, you will find that we uh, tackle some of these subjects in much more detail, and uh, so that's a good resource for you to kind of dig into some of these to get a little bit more uh, information. So any any individual subjects that you're curious about or don't understand. Ray, maybe you could take a couple of minutes to articulate, you're on mute, articulate what you saw happen when we met with uh, the client this week, when we went over an assessment with them. Well, um, you know, uh, Ron and I have used uh, assessment tools for, uh, frankly, over 60 companies. So this, uh, what we did is we shifted to a little different assessment, but the, uh, the, the point in it that I was trying to make earlier seems to be that once you do an assessment, instead of me coming in and saying that I'm the expert or whatever, it's them actually revealing to themselves the things that are important to the company and what are not, and having a conversation about it as opposed to um, you know, suggesting somehow they're not, what they're doing is not right. And so for us to be able to sit down with Gil and his uh, CFO and have conversations about this was, was very meaningful and it caused him to reflect. And I think that's the whole purpose of our, you know, working with clients is, is not to tell them what they're doing is right or wrong, but ask them to consider other options that might improve their outcomes and be better And assessment tools are a powerful way to get at that in a structured methodical way that you make sure you cover everything. Yeah, I, I think you're right on target there, Ray. And one of the things that makes it difficult, you know, to, to get moving is to uh, build, rate the priorities. What should you be working on now? And yep. then build, build action plans from those priorities. So, the analysis that we've just discussed helps you understand 
how to prioritize. And then that's, that's what really gets the ball rolling is you've done some assessment, uh, you, you've got the analysis, you have more knowledge about your business directions, markets, and now you can say, wow, we are really deficit in this area. And if we could fix that, that will make a huge improvement in our business. It's like, well, yes, yep. get the low hanging fruit, get started, just start knocking them off one by one. And I think, you know, to, to the point that uh, Ed had made earlier, when you do this first, the strategic plan then becomes a lot more meaningful because as you just pointed out, the priorities are all laying there before you, you know, so yeah. it's not yeah. like, you right. know, it's like setting up goals and, and then realizing, well, hey, I can't accomplish that or that's beyond my means or, you know, for whatever reason. So, yeah. so I think this, this is a much more effective way of moving forward. Well, and you build you build a strategy ab about a, uh, uh, a around around customer base and market. Mm -hmm. But what do you find? What happens when you find out that your goals uh, were over there, but somebody moved the goalpost? It was the customer yeah. who moved the goalpost. Yeah, yeah. So well, now, I, now, what good is your strategy? So yeah. the other thing I learned a long time ago: nothing happens in business unless you have a relationship. And um, in my opinion, going through one of these comprehensive business assessments helps build that relationship yeah. Yeah, that's between a the consultant and, and the client. And it makes it real. It, it yeah. takes away um, a lot of the inhibitors yeah. and, and brings people together. Can, I, can we work together? And I think after you do one of these and you look at all the opportunities out there, that question is answered very quickly, whether or not you can make this thing happen or not. Right. And that's true, true with the management as well. You bring in your managers and pretty soon they get kind of excited. Things feel yep. a little stale yeah. to them. And now they, they've, they've been involved a little bit more and they, they realize that this, this is a team sport in, in many ways. And yep. if you're trying to sell your business, it better be a team sport because you have to be the captain. You can't be the quarterback. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Or well, the coach, uh, maybe. Yeah, the coach, yeah. maybe not quite the right metaphor. All right, gentlemen. Very good. Uh, we've been uh, at this for nearly an hour. Uh, unless there's anything else, I think this is a good opportunity for us to wrap it up. Uh, Ed, you did a great job. Um, we're hoping that as people look at this and they have some interesting questions, feel free to reach out to either Ed, me, or Ron. Uh, would you move that end slide so they know kind of how to get to us? Yeah, thank you, Ray. So Very these good. are, if you need to reach us, uh, as Ron said, you can go to our uh, channel, uh, Micro Giants. Is that right? It's Micro Giants. If you add mentoring to it, you'll get the top, we'll get the top spot. We don't quite okay. own Micro Giants yet. We're about third or fourth on Micro Giants. All right. Micro, micro Giants mentoring will take you to our um, our entire um, library of different topics that we've gone over over the past year. And we've got over 27 of them. Uh, we've done we've tried to do a good job of giving you some summary as to what the conversation's about, but uh, we appreciate your participating. Uh, Ed, thank you for the good job you did. Ron, as usual, always appreciate your insights. So uh, thank you and we'll see you for the next session of Three Amigos. Okay. Bye. See you.